Hello again. I spent a few pounds last night on acquiring a Kindle edition of a new book for children called Brilliant Black British History. It was written by a Nigerian woman called Atinuki and published by Bloomsbury, who really ought to know better. Still, it is endorsed by both Diane Abbott and David Lammy, which must tell us something about the quality of the thing, I suppose. I thought I would read a few passages out so that viewers can judge for themselves what to make of it. After describing the skeleton of Cheddar Man, which is uh, 10,000 years old and found near the Cheddar Gorge in England, we are told on page 14 that scientists at the Natural History Museum tested the DNA and found that, and I quote, his skin was as dark as dark can be. Firstly, of course, the DNA was not tested at the Natural History Museum at all, but rather at University College London. The results were then analysed by a geneticist called Susan Walsh at Indiana University in the United States. The testing related to just 16 genes connected with skin colour. But of course, skin colour is actually affected by hundreds of genes, which is why people have given up trying to uh, calculate the skin colour of uh, prehistoric people these days. The DNA was so old that it had degraded. When the Natural History Museum announced that Cheddar Man was black, Susan Walsh quickly pointed out that it was actually impossible to say what colour his skin was. I give a link in the description to this video to a piece by New Scientist about this. Nobody has the least idea what colour Cheddar Man's skin was. The author of the book then goes on to say that this means that Britain was a black country for the next seven and a half thousand years, which means in turn that Britain was black for longer than it has been white, which is simply mad. She then goes on to claim that DNA studies carried out in 2019 showed that the people that built Stonehenge had dark brown skin, but this is simply untrue. She's made it up. Then there are the usual claims that the Emperor Septimius Severus was back. Not merely from North Africa, mind, which is true, but actually black. We know this is false because there are paintings and statues of him. Then we have a complete lie, which is that DNA tests tell us that 11% of people in Roman York were black, with African parents and grandparents. This may be found on page 27 of the book and is completely untrue. The teeth of some skeletons from that time have been tested for the various isotopes in them and it seems likely that some of those people were born and spent their childhoods in Europe. But there's no evidence whatever to suppose that they were African. This idea is based upon the analysis of skulls which, according to an American computer program called 4DISC, are similar to modern-day African-Americans. It was, of course, the 4DISC program which gave rise to the story that Beachy Head Woman, the Roman skeleton found in Sussex, was African. Of course, this was widely publicised as being the first African person from Roman times found in Britain. However, when her DNA was tested, she turned out to be entirely European, almost certainly from Cyprus. <laughs> On the same page of this book, we are told that the Ivory Bangle Lady, as she is known from Roman York, had her DNA tested in 2010, and that this proved that she was African as well. This too is a barefaced lie. No such DNA testing was carried out. The identification of her supposed African ancestry was, once again, based on measurements of her skull. On page 33, we're told that in 2013, two schoolboys found a skull in a river in Gloucestershire, which is true. Then it is claimed that DNA testing revealed this to be an African woman from the Middle Ages, which is absurd. In fact, the skull was measured and put through the four-disc programme 
by police officers. The foredesk again being the one which suggested that the beachy head woman was African. I give a link to a piece about this uh, discovery in Gloucestershire in the description to this video. There has never been any DNA evidence for sub-Saharan Africans in Britain during the Roman period or the Middle Ages. Anybody that claims this is not telling the truth. I honestly don't have the heart to go through the rest of this book in detail just now, though I might do so in a few days. We are told on page 57 that modern historians think that Queen Charlotte had African ancestry, uh, an idea which has, of course, been lifted straight from Bridgerton. On page 65, there's mention of a naval commander in the Royal Navy called Captain Jack Perkins, who was, it seems, the first black officer in the Royal Navy. Actually, the idea that he was black didn't arise until a single mention 30 years after his death, and it was probably made as a slur on his memory or an insult. What is certain is that when Jack Perkins died in 1812, he owned a plantation in Jamaica, along with 26 slaves. But this is not mentioned in the book. I do a link to the Wikipedia page on this man in the description to this video. Some of the statements made in this book are truly grotesque and weird. For instance, when discussing how the British Empire exploited Africa, we are told on page 75 that without the mineral coltan from the Congo there would be no mobile phones or tablets. Many children were forced to work as miners. Of course, this ore has only been valuable and dug out of the ground since it was needed for mobile phones. The Victorians didn't have any use for it. The children are being forced to work as miners now in an independent African country, which was in any case never part of the British Empire. It belonged to Belgium. One of the reasons I find books of this kind irritating is that they ignore the real history of Africans in Britain. There were a few Africans and Caribbeans around in the 19th century, and their stories are actually quite interesting, but you will never hear about them in this kind of book. Strangely enough, I have written more about the real history of black people in Britain than any of these people, which is, to say the least of it, <coughs> rather ironic. Here, for example, are two guidebooks um, that I've published, written by me, few years ago, about 10 years ago, in fact, one to Kensington and one to Kingston-upon-Thames. See how clever it is, they were not a guide to Kingston-upon-Thames. I did quite a bit of walking around Kings Kingston-on-Thames to write this book. See this American colonial style house, which is quite unusual looking. Let me just read out what I wrote about it. You'll never hear mention of this in any of these books about supposed Africans in Britain either. In 1761, an army officer returning from Africa presented as souvenirs to Sir John Phillips a parakeet, a foreign duck and a five-year-old black slave who was later named Caesar Picton. Picton was freed after the death of St John and his wife and set up business at Kingston as a coal merchant. He proved to have a flair for business, first renting and then in 1795 buying outright his premises at number 52 High Street. So successful was he that he retired and lived the life of a gentleman until his death in 1836 at the age of 81. His business premises and home are still standing and are today marked by a blue plaque. The house is of an unusual design, reminiscent of the American colonial style. Here is a really interesting story about an African, a black African, who became a successful merchant in the late 18th and early 19th century in Kingston-upon-Thames. But you won't hear any mention of him in any of these books which claim that Africans were living in Britain in the 19th century. Or let me give you another example, if you will. Be patient. 
is King Ketchwire, King of the Zulus. Do any viewers know that he used to live in Kensington? I'll warrant that they don't. I wrote here that on the side of an unremarkable block of Victorian flats in Melbury Road, just off Kensington High Street, are two blue plaques, one above the other. One tells us that William Holman Hunt, a founder of the pre-Raphaelite artistic movement, lived here during the late 19th century. This is all very right and proper. The pre-Raphaelites mostly lived in Kensington and Chelsea at one time or another. The other plaque, though, tells us that while Holman Hunt was living here in 1882, King Ketchwayo, leader of the Zulu nation, moved in next door. One cannot help but wonder at this peculiar circumstance. Did the exiled King of the Zulus pop round to Holman Hunt's studio in order to borrow a cup of sugar or a shilling for the gas meter? Again, here is a piece of black history that you won't see mentioned in any of those books that King Ketchwayo actually lived off Kensington High Street. I mentioned this simply to show that it's not that I'm rejecting outright the idea of black people living in this country in the 19th century. I'm saying that it needs to be researched carefully and people need to go out and explore and find out about it rather than simply copying and pasting stuff from dubious internet sources.